if you're if you're ready, let's let's get underway. Yeah, go ahead. Go. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlisle. This is the Aquirus podcast. My special guest today is Jack Forehand. He's a partner at Validia. We're going to talk to him about value investing, about whether it's broken, whether it's still alive, what may have caused the death of value investing. We're going to talk to him right after this. Tobias Carlisle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Jack. How are you? Good. How are you? Very well, thanks. Uh, Thanks so much for joining me here today. You're a partner at Validia. Can you just... Tell me a little bit about what Validia is. Sure. Validia is, our goal at Validia is to follow strategies that beat the market over time, quantitative strategies. And so what we do is we try to find books, academic papers, anything that has a long-term record of beating the market, and we try to quantify it, program the models, and then allow allow our subscribers to follow them. Um, Our models fall into pretty much two different camps. One is people who have actually beat the market over time, people like Warren Buffett, Ben Graham, Peter Lynch. All those people have either written a book themselves or had a book written about them in the case of Buffett that outlined a strategy that was that at least had enough quantitative elements that we could capture it. Um, the other part of what we do is the academic work. So if, if an academic has studied value or momentum or something over a long period of time, they've developed a strategy that we think was, was well tested and that has a long-term track record of beating the market, we'll program those as well. So we have kind of the practitioner side of it and then we have the academic side of it. And in all, we have about 45 models we follow right now. When you're looking at someone, say, like Buffett, so Buffett hasn't written a book, but he's written pretty extensively in letters. And then there are these quantitative analyses of him. There's uh, Joel Greenblatt's, who I often talk about, his magic formula, which has the two parts to it. But then there's also AQR has that study where they look at they looked at the, the factor influences. And so they say, oh, he's, he's levered 1.7 times by virtue of the float and he kind of tracks the quality factor. How do you guys go about recreating what Buffett's doing? Well, in our case, we use the book Buffettology, which was written by Mary, Mary Buffett, his ex-daughter-in-law. And inside there, there actually was a pretty step-by-step guide to how Buffett might look at a stock. And so it's important to note, though, we're not trying to mirror what Buffett holds. You know, what we're saying is that that quantitative strategy on its own stands alone very well. It performs very well. But we're not trying to look at Buffett's portfolio and say, well, our strategy is not working if we're not owning the same stuff Buffett's owning. You know, we're just trying to say, you know, if you follow that strategy in a disciplined, emotion-free way, you can do well. And, you know, that strategy has things like 10 years of consistent earnings growth, 10 years of high ROE, 10 years of high return on capital. So it ends up being, you know, if you take a step back and look at it from a factor perspective, it ends up being a quality type strategy. Um, it has an element of value in it, but it tends to track quality pretty well. And how, so, how, how, how has that done over the last decade? Because it's been a pretty rough run for value. It has. It's, it's done a lot better than our value strategies just because of the quality element um, I was talking about. I know you looked at, at one point in your book, you looked at Greenblatt's strategy and said, you know, if you carve the quality out of there, you get a better return. And, you know, we, we've seen a similar thing, but in the past decade, that has not been true. You know, in the past decade, if you anything to get away from deep value has been a really good thing. And so Buffett gets away from deep value with the quality element, whereas our stuff like based on Graham and people like that has done much more poorly just because it's tracking more of a deep value type approach. Uh, you guys also have an ETF. How do you construct yes. the ETF? So the ETF is based on blending the strategies together. So what we try to do is, you know, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel when we, when we built these strategies. We wanted to follow strategies that had worked over time. Where we think we can add value is if we can combine them together. So if we can take different value strategies and create more of a value composite, or if we can blend a value strategy with a quality strategy, with a low vol strategy, with a momentum strategy, that's where we think we can add value, and, and that's what our ETF does. Um, the other element of what our ETF does, which is why it's heavily in value right now, is we, we are slight believers in factor timing. We do believe when something is very out of favor, you can slowly and methodically rotate towards it and add some, you know, some excess return over time. We know we'll never get the timing of it right, but we think you can add some excess return over time. And so our, our ETF is actually very much a value strategy right now 
just because we think all the long-term metrics indicate that value is very attractive. That sounds a little bit like Cliff Asness's sin a little. Were you at all influenced by that one? Right, yeah. Actually, I wrote a, an article at one point that I called Sin Less Than a Little because <laughs> um, Cliff was talking about market timing with Sin, sin, sin a Little. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I said with factors, you should probably sin even less than that because factor timing is really, really hard to do. And emotions become a big part of it because, you know, you're going to be early. You're going to look bad for a while and, you know, before you get the rewards from doing it. And so, you know, we, we do it, but we do it very slowly. We do it very methodically. We don't believe in binary market timing. We're never going to say, you know, today's the day to go all in on value. But we do think if you slowly add to something that's out of favor, you can enhance your returns over time. Well, that, that's, that sort of, that really cleverly answered the next question I was going to ask you, which was, I, I think that your ETF is a little bit value biased and, and I wanted to know why, but I think you probably cover that pretty closely for me. Um, we've, had your, we've had your partner, uh, Justin Carboneau, on previously, but I wanted to get you on because uh, you've written several blog posts that I found particularly interesting. And one of the things that, uh, that you've done that I really like is asking whether uh, well value has been underperforming, but asking whether this is sort of a is a permanent state of affairs. And I thought I thought you did a really good job. But do you want to do you want to uh, take us through? I've got I've got some of the the headings that you used here. So one of the first ones that you highlighted, um, the world is different. What what does that mean? And and what does that mean for value? So I took this from uh, Ben Hunt, who's one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter, um, and, and he's sort of talked about this. You know what the Federal Reserve did in the wake of the financial crisis has changed things in many ways. Interest rates have been depressed for a really long period of time. You know, they're doing everything they can to stimulate the economy. You know, what if that is a change compared to the past? And what does that mean for value? You know, interest rates being depressed, the, the evidence is sort of mixed on whether that is a bad thing for value. You know, in, in theory, it definitely would be because more of the value of a growth company is in the future and more of the value of value companies in the present. So when rates are low, it's better for growth with that low discount rate. But it, I think the evidence, you know, O'Shaughnessy and people like that have looked at this and the evidence as to whether that matters, you know, is, is kind of mixed. But what ben, Ben's point was that this is more of a random world now. You know, you can't, you have to take what's all these base rates and everything we're using in the past and you have to throw them out. And you have to say, well, if this is the new world, we can't rely on all that pre-GFC data to say, you know, value is coming back. It's, it's more of a random thing. And I think he was arguing more for using all the factors together and not necessarily saying, you know, something like value is going to come back because it's struggled. So that, that is what I was getting at there is, you know, the world may be a little bit different than the one we've built our data based on. How do you feel about that argument? I actually think it's one of the better ones. Um, you know, although I interviewed Jim O'Shaughnessy for our blog and he took the opposite side of that and said, you know, there's been many, many times people say the world is different. And none of those times was the world actually different. And so it's one thing to say this quantitative easing is going to go on forever. And no matter what happens, they're going to continue doing it. But, you know, we could have a change in, you know, politics. We could have a change in anything, you know, people on the Fed. And, and that could change. I mean, down the road, there may not be quantitative easing. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's a good argument, but I, I don't think it kills all the data that we use to support value because, I mean, we've got 100 plus years of data to support value. And I think that overrides the argument. It, sort of embedded in, in your argument for why it might not uh, persist is this idea that it actually is right, though, that low interest rates do, in fact, uh, stimulate the, the glamour stocks more, and, and sort of that tends to leave the value stocks behind. You, do you, you feel that that, me that mechanism is correct? That's, that's the way it works? I don't know. You know, I think I think in theory it sounds perfect. Um, but, you know, people like O'Shaughnessy Asset Management have looked at it and they've said, you know, there's no correlation there. It's interesting. Uh, the, I don't know if you follow the website factorresearch.com. I do. Yeah. They just did something that said, you know, it's not the level of interest rates. It's more whether the yield curve is, is flattening or steepening. And, you know, maybe that's the case. You know, may, maybe in a case where the yield curve is flattening, that's bad for value. And, and in the case where the yield curve is steepening, it's better. And, you know, value has a lot of financial stocks. So you, that could certainly make sense that that maybe is a better argument. And that seems to be more backed up the, from the data than just whether rates are high or low. One of the things uh, that I find most interesting about many of these arguments is that the, the, uh, the performance always leads the theory. So, you know, for example, we, there, there are lots and lots of articles now about how price to book has broken down and it's no longer a very good factor. But there were no articles like that before 
price to book broke down as a factor. So I, I always right. wonder whether are we just fitting a narrative to the data that we see? And if it goes back to working again, do people say, oh, well, all that stuff went away? I think that's right. I mean, you're not seeing any articles right now about how low volatility is broken um, because low, low volatility has been killing it. You know, and if, if low volatility ever becomes broken, you know, it's going to be after low volatility has struggled for a really long time. And we're, then we're going to take the time to look at it and say, you know, is there something wrong with this? So, yeah, I mean, the, the thing with price to book is the arguments make sense. Um, you know, intangible assets are an issue for price to book. I mean, some estimates are intangible assets are something like 80, 85 percent of total assets at this point, And a price to book calculation doesn't even consider them. And a point you made, I interviewed you for our blog, and a point you made to me is, you know, all these buybacks have created these negative equity situations. So that's also distorting price to book. So I think when you, when you look at price to book, I think the conclusion to draw is, you know, price to book probably has the worst performance of any of the value factors, but it nonetheless still has an excess return. It's not something that, you know, is producing a return less than the market over time, but it is probably the worst of the, of the various factors if you look at the long-term data. One of the interesting things, and I've, you, you can get from the FAMA French, from Ken French's website that they've got, fr he, he's, he posts all of the free uh, data series. And one of the data series that he has is price to book value data broken into all of the deciles and terciles and all, anything you might want to look at. And that has worked um, pretty well over the full data set, except for two very pronounced periods. And one of them is right at the very start of the data set. And it starts in the 1920s. I can't remember whether it's pre or post the, the, the Great Crash, but it definitely had this huge underperformance that, that looks very similar to the huge underperformance that it's having now. And, uh, and it's been, a, it's been a, a mainstay strategy because it's, uh, you know, there's lots to recommend it that, that your book value shouldn't change that much on a quarter to quarter basis, whereas earnings can be all over the place. Do you. Um, do you think that if, if it sort of comes back again and many of those arguments become invalid, like it did work for nearly 100 years? Yeah, you know, no. I mean, I think the, the arguments are valid, but I, I think it also doesn't mean it doesn't work. And, uh, you know, Corey Hofstein had a really good piece on this. And to say statistically that this price to book is not working, it's something like we would need 80 years of data. And it's the same thing on the way back. You know, if it starts working for a decade, so does that tell us that it now works again or does that tell us that it just had a good decade? You know, you could argue since price to book has probably been the worst factor during this value downturn that it could, if it, even if it has no excess return, the next decade it could produce outperformance and it still is not, you know, a valuable factor. Just It could just be a mean reversion thing because it's been the worst during this particular downturn and these asset heavy type companies could start outperforming again. And, you know, it, it could really tell us nothing about its long term performance. So, you know, I think we do use price to book in part. We, we use really a composite approach that has a lot of because the strategies we follow all use different metrics. But... I don't think it's dead. We do use it to to an extent, but I do think it's probably the worst of the factors. Uh, one of the reasons I think that low volatility could start underperforming, well, low volatility is particularly interesting because it sort of seems to fly in the face of efficient market hypothesis, which, which is that higher volatility should generate higher returns, but it seems that the inverse is the case. But one of the reasons why it might stop working, and this is one of the things that you addressed in your paper, is simply that too many people are doing it but you were talking about it in relation to value. So wh why, right. why is value going to stop working? Because, or why, why do you think that too many people have been doing it? Why has it stopped working? I think it's one of the weakest arguments I have. Um, you know, but you could argue there's many, many value ETFs. Obviously, what was in the academic research has become utilized in the real world a lot more. So there are many, many people throwing a lot of money at value. But if that was a valued, valid argument, you would think that spreads would be widening. Um, you know, if, if too many people or sorry, spreads would be narrowing. So if too many people were following value, value would get more expensive relative to growth. You'd see narrow spreads, but we're actually seeing the opposite of that. Spreads are widening out. So I don't think there's really much evidence to say that too many people are following value. I mean, I guess it's a long term concern, but I think in the near term, that's probably the weakest of the arguments I came up with. It's probably more efficient now than it was when Buffett started out. But even when Buffett started out, he had to dig through. The sort of positions that he was putting on in his hedge fund were tiny, tiny little positions where you had to go and read through pages of documents and dig them up. Even he was working pretty hard back then to find those opportunities. Uh, I, I, think, I, think, I, it's a, I think it's a reasonable argument because I saw, I covered this on my blog, Greenbacked in 2009, Goldman Sachs Asset Management said, there's this massive crowding into price to book. The quant strategy is going to struggle. And so they were, they were, they were right about that. They have been right about that for this next decade. 
it's 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 a tough one because for the reasons that you identify, the spreads are still pretty wide. I don't talk to a lot of people who are in the finance industry who aren't value guys who have a great deal of respect for value, you know. You're right. Because they look at the last thirty years, they say I worked for five of those last thirty years. You know, I'll I'll take whatever is not that. I'll take the thing that works for twenty five out of thirty years. That's right. You know, you know, if you carve out that two thousand to two thousand seven period, I mean, it's been a really really long period of underperformance for value. You know, the outperformance was just so huge over that 2000 to 2007 period that it made up for a lot of the other stuff that was going on. One of the argu other arguments in that paper that you have is that the capital that is following value is more permanent. And this came from the anonymous Twitter account, Modest, well, the pseudonymous Twitter account, Modest Proposal. Right. I took that from uh, one of Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcasts with him. And the theory is, you know, those of us that are value investors, what we want is for everybody else who's a value investor to bail. <laughs> You know, that that allows the factor to work over time. If it worked all the time, you know, then it would stop working. So, you know, and there's some evidence and I, he didn't really have much evidence to it, but there is some belief that, you know, because staying with value after 1999 worked, that more people are staying with value now and they're, they're less likely to bail. And, you know, I don't really know. I mean, flow data is very inaccurate. I'm not really sure how you would figure that out. But there, there is an argument I've heard made that, you know, if, if you want people bailing, if people are not bailing, then that's bad for us as value investors because it's going to lead to you know the fact you're not working as well as it has historically. That's something that you and I have discussed in the past. That flow data it's really hard to come by. When when, when the, the flow data that I see is really mixed, they seem to it all says it flows to a blend, and the blend might include value and momentum, which is not very helpful. Right, and you have so many multi-factor funds, and you know people using different impl implementations of value. There's so many funds with value in their name that really don't use what would be an academic definition of value. You know, it's very hard to figure out how much money is flowing to value. The next point you make, which I think is a kind of an interesting one, uh, big data leads to more value traps, which are things that are genuinely, that, that even though they might screen as undervalued, they really are just bad companies. Right. So the, the example I use in the piece is I was using the example of Walmart, which may not be a value stock right now, but it's just for example purposes. If, if Walmart is really cheap and my value strategy, you know, based on past earnings likes Walmart, well, what happens if this new, these, with this new data, hedge funds have drones up over Walmart and they see that the parking lots are empty or they have all the credit card data and they see that people are spending less money at Walmart. You know, what if there's data out there that's not reflected in past fundamentals that may make those past fundamentals less valuable? And that was the argument I was making is, you know, th there might be stuff out there now that people who used historical fundamental statements in the past that was not available that maybe changes the how valuable historical fundamental statements are now. Um, you know, it's another tough one to try to figure out whether it's true or not. It's a tough one to prove, but I think it is true that you know there's more data now and people are doing everything they can to get that data. And you know, maybe that makes the piece of data we use, which is historical fundamental data, less valuable. I sometimes wonder whether that arms race to create more data and and better sort of AI and machine learning to analyze it, if it all just kind of cancels itself out. You know, Buffett gives that example of people going to the, you go to some parade and everybody stands on their tiptoes to get a better view, which eliminates the, the effort of everybody else. Does all of that big data uh, kind of cancel each other out because everybody gets that edge pretty quickly? And so then you just go back right. to historical financial statements. That's right. If, if there is a valuable data set out there, whoever owns it is going to sell it to as many people as they can possibly sell it to. And so whatever edge is associated with that is going to go away pretty quickly as all the other hedge funds pile on and try to use it. So that's probably a good argument against, you know, what I'm saying. But, you know, we, I still want to recognize that, that data is out there and people are using it. And, you know, maybe it devalues the data we're using. Uh, and the final argument that you made is that value is a bet against tech, which that, that certainly seems to be the problem. I would, have, I would say that that's the main problem over the last 10 years. It hasn't held a lot of these, uh, the tech names that seem to have made all the money. That's right. You know, and it's, it's been a bet on financials and it's been a bet on energy and it's been a bet against tech. And those are all not, have not been good things. And even if you run a sector neutral value strategy, which a lot of people do, you know, you don't tend to be buying. If you, if I had a, a forced myself to have an allocation to tech, I'm not going to be buying Google and Netflix. I'm probably going to be buying Seagate and Western Digital and Micron Technology and companies like that. So, even if I'm doing it sector neutral, I still technically have a bet against the high growth tech that's driving the market. But the, the flip side of that argument is, you know, if you looked at it in 1990, in the 1990s, value was a bet against tech, and then it became that the fact that it was a bet against tech became a really, really good thing. So, you know, it's part of the nature of it, 
But, you know, because these tech companies are making more money now, they're doing much better than the tech companies of the late 90s were. You do have to worry about if they continue to dominate the world, if they continue to, to grow at the rates they're growing, you know, is the fact that value strategies don't have, you know, aren't investing in them, is that going to be a drag on the strategies going forward? I think that that's, that's an interesting argument, that, that comparison between the late 1990s where they were basically – they had to come up with the unusual metrics like eyeballs and clicks and things like that to sort of justify their valuations. Whereas they say the ones now, they're mu- they have much more in the in the case in, in the way of revenues. They still don't have a lot in the way of profits, though. Not a lot of that no. revenue is falling to the bottom line. So there's a lot of money that's been invested in those tech companies, and I I, I sometimes think so. Use WeWork as an example. There's no reason. There's nothing particularly technological about WeWork. It's still ultimately leasing space and then chopping it up and subleasing it to somebody else, which is that's not a new strategy. But it it does. If you look at the they've they've grown very quickly, but that's just because they've jammed a whole lot of capital into it. And I think that some of the tech companies have done the same thing. If you just jam an enormous amount of capital into something, you're going to see growth. You don't necessarily see profits, and you don't necessarily see return on equity. I don't know. Yeah, you know, WeWork is a perfect example of what you're just talking about. If you want to talk about making up metrics, the whole community adjusted EBITDA that they came up with is a perfect example of the same type of thing you were seeing in the 90s. But the one thing that I will say is different is, you know, if you look at the top end of the technology, if you look at Google, Google is a profitable company. Amazon is a company that if they chose to be profitable, could be a profitable company. So, you know, there is more of that going on that that some of this underperformance of value has been a function of fundamentals has been a function of some of these companies, these tech companies have done better than the tech companies of the late 90s. That doesn't mean the valuations aren't inflated or they're not crazy or anything like that. It just means that, you know, those companies have performed better than the internet type companies of the late 90s have performed. But Google and other companies like Apple have been value companies on on occasion. Over the last decade, Google's been on a couple of times if you backed out the cash, it got pretty cheap. And true, true of Apple as well, which I've sort of written about. I don't expect tech companies or any company to be a value all the time, but I think if they become value stocks on occasion, that's sort of proof that value is still working. Yeah, you know, and we've actually seen with our with our Warren Buffett model, um, Apple comes in and out fairly regularly, depending on the valuation. You know, when the valuation gets a little high, it doesn't, but it's been in there three or four times over the past decade. So it definitely has been a value stock at times. So one of my one of my favorite posts of yours, where you t- you looked at all of those things that all of the problems with value, and then you summed it up, and you were one of the one of the ideas in it was that you said that the academic argument for value still holds. So what is the academic argument for value? Well, they're really it's really a two part argument. One part is that value is riskier, and you know you'd expect if you take on additional risk, you're going to get on you're going to get additional return. And, you know, with what we're going through right now, it's hard to argue that value is not risky, you know, that value is not riskier than the market. I mean, we've gone through a long drawdown here. We've gone through a long period of poor performance. And I think it's hard to argue value is not has not continued to be riskier than the market as a whole. The other one is the behavioral argument, which is that if you buy a basket of value stocks in general, the the market is going to overestimate the problems with those stocks. That doesn't mean that a lot of those companies don't have problems. They all have problems. It doesn't mean that some of them don't have worse problems than, than the market has estimated, because some do. But on average, the problems are not as bad as the market has said. And so there is a behavioral ele- element to it as well. And you know, if, if you put both of those together, that argu- both of those still seem to hold. I mean, I don't think there's really much evidence that either one of those is different now. So I think that should give all of us that invest in value some faith that maybe things might get better here at some point in the future, um, although who knows when that's going to be. Do you, do you have a preference for either of those two arguments, the risk-based one or the or the behavioral-based one? No, I really don't. Um, you know, I, I'm not great on the academic stuff, so I don't. Um, I, I like the behavioral argument because behavioral anomalies tend to la- tend to persist forever, um, whereas the the risk-based ones are a little bit different. So I do like the fact that you know if there's a behavioral thing going on, if people are always are going to behave behave badly, then that's probably a tailwind to value, and I do think that's a good thing. The, uh, the risk-based one, I think, is interesting because I, I've understood it as the individual names are riskier, but I think that that has morphed over the last few years into uh, value itself is riskier because it has these long stretches of underperformance. And so it's the, it's the tracking error that introduces the risk into value. Do you, do you, have, you, have you noticed that change or do you, have, am I stating the problem incorrectly? No, I think you have. I think you're, you're, you're seeing people make both arguments now. You're seeing them make the argument that the individual names are riskier, but also that you know, the, the risk of value is reflected in these really long, drawn-out periods. And that you know, something, if, if it has those long, drawn-out periods, has to be 
riskier than you know than what it's tracking in the S&P 500. So one of my uh, one of the other blog posts that you wrote that I think is great, where you're discussing the mechanics of value. So can you take us through the mechanics of value? Yeah, what I was trying to figure out there is if, if you're going to develop a value strategy or really any factor strategy, what are the major questions you have to answer? So you may have them in front of you, I don't, but the, uh, the first question is what is your universe you're going to invest in? And, and it's a major question because you know you, a lot of people will just invest in the large caps S&P 500 type companies. You can broaden it out and invest in maybe you know if you if you want to have some sort of liquidity requirements, probably 2,700, 3,000 companies if you want to include the small and mid caps in there. And so what you do there is a really big part of what your strategy is, because one of the things that happens is all of us that invest get judged against the S&P 500, but the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index of 500 companies, the 500 largest companies. If you think about that compared to a 3,000 stock index that's equally weighted, which is basically what most you know, factor value type investors are doing, there's going to be massive deviations in return before you even start paring down that index by using value or momentum or anything. And so it's, it's really important to understand if you're using that all stock universe, you're going to have a lot of tracking error. You're going to be very different than the S&P 500. And, and for us, that's what we want to do. You know, we think there's more alpha in those small names than there are in the big names. But if, if what you're concerned about is tracking error and you're, you're concerned about not getting too different from your benchmark and not having these long periods of struggle, then you probably want to use something more like an S&P 500 universe. But you could then, you could implement that strategy. You could implement value in an S&P 500 universe and you could say, we, we'll find the decile, we'll find the 10% that's cheapest on whatever our particular measure might be. And that, that's 50 stocks. That's a pretty good portfolio. But it's not equal weighted. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's not I, market I have, nothing, I have no problem whatsoever with doing that. You know, I just think the evidence shows that if you include the small and mid cap stocks, you, you get more alpha. You know, if, if you look at it as an example, like if you and I are going out to dinner and you give me a choice of three restaurants or you give me a choice of 300 restaurants, I'm more likely to find the type of restaurant I want in the 300. And that's the same way. If you, know, you give me 500 stocks and say, find all these factors you're looking for, or you give me 3,000 stocks and say, find all these factors you're looking for, I'm more likely to find the factors I'm looking for in the 3,000. And so that's why we do that. You know, there's obviously issues in small caps. There's, it's, it's a little tougher to execute. Um, you, know, you have more, more costs transactionally, but we think the, the additional alpha you get down there is worth it. So we do it and we're willing to live with a tracking error for doing that. It's interesting, isn't it, that you, you use that bigger universe and you equal weight and you've already taken a big step away from the S&P 500 and you should, at, over time, that, that portfolio should do better. This is before you even put in the value tilt, but you will have long periods of time where you underperform and I'm, I'm guessing it's probably underperformed over the last two, five, ten years. Oh, yeah, yeah, by, by a wide margin. Um, and you're right. I mean, anything the research shows, anything you do to break the link with price, you know, enhances your returns. So, you know, and basically anything you could wait by letter of the alphabet, you know, you can equal weight, you can do anything. But, you know, if you think about it, if with the academic research, if you take the 500 largest companies market cap weighted and you compare that to an equal weight of all the companies, you know, the equal weight of all the companies is going to do better over time because it's breaking that link with price. Um, one of the th one of the ideas that you covered in there that I like is uh, avoiding value traps. So how do we avoid value traps? <laughs> well, the the first answer to that is you don't because you can't. You know, you're you're buying these cheap companies that you know many of them are cheap for a reason. So you know you can't just completely avoid value traps. There's no way to do it. But the the way we like to look at it is you know when we build quant strategies, we try to say you know if, if I or you or anybody is looking at it as a person. How would we try to find situations where the past fundamental data we're using is not indicative of the future? And you know, that's what we tried to do when we built our value trap system. And so one of the examples we use is, well, what if you know, we're using these past earnings to for our valuations, but analysts are estimating that earnings are going to plummet in the future? That, that's an example of a situation where maybe those past earnings don't tell me what's going to happen in the future. Now, analyst estimates are notoriously bad. So I don't want to pretend like we're using, we're not trying to count on analyst estimates being accurate. We're trying to count on them being directionally accurate. So if, and I'll give you an example. If an energy company, if the price of oil just got cut in half and an energy company made $2 a share last year, but they're expected to lose money this year, that may be a company where we don't want to trust that historical valuation. And so the analyst estimates are going to fall dramatically in a situation like that. And our, and our quality, our negative quality system might screen that company out based on that. So that that's one example of. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I, was, I I didn't want to interrupt. Keep going. Um, so that's one example of what we do. 
Another one would be obviously debt magnifies everything. So if if you have a cheap company, if they have a lot of problems, if they get into trouble, if they've got a lot of debt, they're not going to make it. And so we want to screen out very, very high levels of debt. So that's another example of something we screen for. Um, another one is we want to say we want to kind of have a catch all for what if there's something going on with the company that we don't recognize in the data, but that the market recognizes it. So we use there's two ways I think that can be that can be done. One is really, really low relative strength. The other is high short interest. So in both of those cases, the market is saying there's something major wrong with this company. We may want to exclude it. Um, and I don't know that there's a fourth one in our, uh, our value trap thing that I don't have in front of me, but we do have one other one that we, uh, we use as well. I, I, I like those approaches because uh, I think that a lot of value investing is trying to buy things that appear to be value traps. In a, and my definition of a value trap, I guess, is more like just the business can't recover. The business is sort of declining all the time because there's some problem with the business. But I like you, you still in that instance, you still want to have, you know, if it's got a healthy balance sheet, you could still go through all that that process that you've described, healthy balance sheet, low, short interest, um, reasonably good relative strength, and it could still be a value trap. And that's just something that you kind of have to live with. That's the risk that you are taking on as a value investor. And the reason that you do it is because when the market gets those things wrong, they 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 reprice a lot. That you get you you get that asymmetric trade where if if it is a right. value trap, it's already priced as a value trap, and it's going to keep on going down as a value trap, and so you're going to lose a little bit of money on it. But if the market's wrong, all of a sudden that valuation is way too cheap, and that's how you make that. And that's in my opinion, that's how value works. Right, and there's there's always going to be an error rate inherent in value. You're always going to have some of these companies that aren't going to work out. So. One of the points I made in the article is any effort to try to eliminate value traps is not going to work because you're going to you're going to basically take away what makes value work by trying to eliminate all the value traps. And so what we try to do is we only eliminate a very small portion. So we try to use negative quality. So we're not looking for value coupled with great quality, great companies. We're trying to only take the absolute worst at the bottom of our database. So we take those four factors we use. We sort all companies based on all four of them, and we just drop the bottom five percent. So these aren't companies that you know have a little bit of debt. These are companies that have a lot of debt. They don't have you know slightly low relative strength. They have terrible relative strength. You know we're trying to find the extremes of these factors and just filter those out. And do you find that filtering out that five percent leads to the the rest of the universe doing better than it would otherwise do? Yes, but just incrementally. It's not you know this is not some you know panacea we found where we've saved value investing. It's just <laughs> a slight improvement. But you know that's that's all we want. You know we're a lot of quant investing is trying to make these little changes and gain like a slight improvement here and a slight improvement there. And that, that's all we're trying to do. You know, the strategies work well without this, but it adds just a little bit of extra return over time. And so that's why we implemented it. Uh, one of the things that I love that Validia does and that you do is that you guys actually track the implementation of these various different strategies rather than just tracking uh, like a theoretical implementation of the strategy. So I'm, I, I wanted to know, and I, I, I asked you uh, a month or so ago, what is the best strategy hedge to value? Because we've gone through this very, very long period of value not working. Because one of the, one of the things, I'm asking myself this question all the time too, if value is not working, what is working? And then I want to take that thing that is working and see how that's looked over the full data set. Because if it looks yep. terrible over the full data set, then I don't want to go into it now. But if it has been sort of, if it has been a pretty good strategy, but it's working very well now, then that's a good strategy hedge to value. So I asked you that, and uh, can you do you remember what you what you told me? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we, we've looked at it in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, the first caveat is, you know, we're not looking at this from an academic perspective. We're running these focused twenty stock strategies, and then we're kind of grouping them by factors and saying which ones which have had value. But the results may be different than you know somebody who's doing a true academic test of this. But I think the first thing is if you want to purely hedge value and you don't care about your long-term return, the best hedge is anti-value or glamour. So if you want to hedge the bottom 10% of stocks, you know, a good thing to do might be buy the top 10% of stocks. The problem is buying the top 10% of stocks on valuation is just a horrible long-term investment strategy. <laughs> and so you're going to get a hedge out of it, but you're going to also bring down your long-term returns by doing it. So that's one that probably should be thrown out. It's, it's been a great one in the past decade. But it's probably one that is not, as you said, is not you know supported by the long-term data. I think of the of the strategies that actually do work over the long term, the best is clearly momentum. Uh, AQR had a paper on this where they looked at it. I think it was called Value and Momentum Everywhere or something like that. 
But yeah, momentum tends to be negative cor negatively correlated with value, but it also has a similar you know, long-term excess return to value. So if you take two things that both have a long-term excess return and that behave differently, you know, you're getting a similar long-term return, but you're getting it at less risk. So I think momentum is probably the best long-term hedge, but the, as we talked about earlier with the GFC, you know, post GFC, all the data is sort of messed up now. So it's it's hard to judge because you know if if you were to look post GFC and say what is the best hedge to value, well, the best hedge to value is low volatility. But before that, low volatility is a horrible hedge to value. So what do you make of that? You know, do you go with the long term data or do you say the world is different and now you know low vol is a great hedge for value? You know, I don't have the answer, but you know, I think if you look, if you want to go to the longest period possible, the best is probably momentum. And I, when you when you say that momentum is a good hedge, are you are you talking you're talking long short or are you talking long only? Yeah, well, uh, you know, when the academics do it, they do it long short. When we do it, we do it based on excess return. So we're looking at the performance of the factor relative to the S and P five hundred over time. And so those differences are best, you know, in our data, the those differences are best hedged by momentum. It gives you a smoother excess return over time than uh, than some of the other factors that are available. Do you? implement any momentum strategies in your in the firm yes we have we have uh, several of them and we what, have uh, what, one what, called yeah what 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 ver what flavors of momentum do you use well we have kind of the traditional ones we have can slim um we have something we have a similar approach at least to can slim um we have one called twin momentum which is based on a paper by a guy called dashon huang and it was um it's based on the theory that if you take price momentum and combine it with fundamental momentum you get a greater excess return so he started with price momentum, and then he found seven fundamental variables, and he looked at the trend in those seven fundamental variables over time to develop a fundamental momentum measure, and then combine those two together into a momentum strategy. What 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 so are that, his fundamental? What what does he like in the fundamental sense? Um, you know, I don't know all of them off the top of my head. Some of them were earnings based. You know, ROE, I think return on capital, I think was in there. There were a bunch of you know what you would think of as the you know the obvious things to probably measure you know how a business is growing and how the health of a business. And he just brought all those together and tried to get like a long-term trend in, in fundamental momentum. And has it but worked? He saw when he, yeah, you know, it, it has. But the, the one thing I have to say as a caveat is, you know, we, we started that strategy in 2009. And 2009 has been a period where momentum has worked, you know, since 2009. So obviously all of this, you know, if I were to judge our value strategy since 2009, I would tell you that value is a terrible way to invest. <laughs> and so we have to judge all of this, you know, in the context of the period we've been following it. So our strategies have just been like everybody else's. The momentum ones have done great since 2009. The low vol ones have done great since 2009. You know, the value ones have done the worst and the quality ones have kind of been in between. How, how does low volatility look over the full data set? Um, you know, we, we only have low volatility since 2009 uh, in our, you know, when we start running our models, we will then put them up on our website and track them. You know, we, we try not to do too much in terms of, you know, we don't do a lot of academic testing and we try not to do too much in terms of back testing, although there is some of that in, in what we do. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, I, I know low volatility certainly hasn't been in the long-term academic work, hasn't been as good as it has been recently, but there's definitely a strong evidence to support low volatility in the academic work as well. What, what, what is the, what, what is the, um, not, not the, not the empirical evidence, but what's the theory behind low volatility? You know, I have trouble, to be honest, I have, I have trouble explaining low volatility. It's, it's the hardest one to explain. You know, people say that, you know, investors chase risk. And so that they drive up, you know, the high beta stocks and then, you know, that makes the low, the low volatility stocks a better, you know, a better value over time. I've heard a lot of different explanations, but, you know, it's definitely the hardest one to explain because it shouldn't, you know, if we have an efficient market, it just shouldn't work. You know, you shouldn't be able to buy lower volatility stocks and get the same or better return than the market over time, but you do. So it's, it's, it's definitely one of the hardest ones to explain. When, when I, when I posed this question to you, you came back with, uh, there, there is this one paper that uh, has done particularly well over the last decade, and it's uh, by Parthe Mohanran. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, that's correct. Partha but, Mohanran, I think is the way to pronounce it. Can you, can you, because I think this, I think it's kind of, uh, I think it's a little bit hilarious, but can you describe the strategy for us? Sure. So he built off of a paper by Joseph Piotrowski. I don't know if you've heard of him, of course. but Joseph Piotrowski took the bottom 20% of the market in terms of price to book and said, how can I identify the companies that do well among these cheap stocks? And he came up with something called F score, which is, you know, I think eight fundamental variables that separated the winners from the losers in those cheap stocks. Well, Mohanran flipped that and he said, all right, can I take the most expensive 20% of stocks 
And can I separate the winners from losers there? And so he came up with something called G score, which is the same thing as, as F score. It's different criteria, but the same theory that, you know, I want to try to find what are the fundamental variables that find these expensive stocks that actually tend to do well versus the expensive stocks that do what most expensive stocks do, which is do poorly. And so that was the gist of the paper. Um, it's, it's important to note that just like any academic paper, both these, these papers are long short. So he was getting some of his value. He really wasn't making a bet on expensive stocks. He was buying some expensive stocks and shorting other expensive stocks, the difference being those eight criteria. So it wasn't a bet. You know, He did get alpha on the long only part of it, and he did get alpha on the short part of it. More of it came from the short part. But it wasn't necessarily a bet on expensive stocks. But we run the long only part of it just because all of our portfolios are long only on our site. And that has been the best performer over the past decade. Um, you know, starting with the most expensive decile and then taking these additional eight criteria and applying them has outperformed everything else we do over the past decade. And has it outperformed uh, the, re you, you know, so if you're splitting that decile or you're splitting that quintile or whatever it is, that you, so you're splitting the most tw expensive 20%, has the ones that, does, does his criteria identify the ones that do better than the ones that don't make it into the model? Yeah, does he does he identify the stocks that do better versus the so stocks that don't do better? If you're just looking in that, so he's he's cutting out the eighty percent of the cheapest stocks, right? So he's just looking at the twenty percent most expensive, and then he's Correct. applying some other filter in in that twenty percent. Do the stocks that he pick out that he picks out of that twenty percent do they do better than the rest of that twenty percent cohort? Yes, yeah, he he definitely found that in the paper, and you know he used things like spending on R and D spending on advertising, return on assets, spending on capital expenditures. You know, he, he had these criteria and tried to figure out what's different about the companies that go on to continue doing well versus the companies that don't continue to do well. And so he, he did find in the paper that he did get, you know, alpha by using those factors to separate the expensive stocks that might have more reason to be expensive versus the expensive stocks that are expensive maybe unjustifiably. I mean, that's kind of genius because if you then short that expensive the rest of the stuff that's in there, that expensive stuff, you know that that over time, that's basically going to not do very well. But you are going to have right. periods of time like the last decade where probably that short hurts you, but you hope that your longs do so much better over that period that, that it works. And that's probably a pretty good hedge to value. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and, you know, the, the actual long only strategy also in terms of excess return is also a pretty good hedge to value. But with the caveat we talked about before, which is, you know, the first criteria of this strategy, if you use the long only portion is, buy expensive stocks and you know if, if you want to out succeed over the long term you know starting with buy expensive stocks is probably not the greatest idea i have to admit that when i saw i i've i tracked down that paper and i had a look at that and when i saw that the first cut was just buy the most expensive 20 percent, i didn't get much further than that that's <laughs> yeah. that's my own bias well for you and i it's, it's basically the opposite of everything we believe in you know you're definitely a value investor and i tend to be a value investor as well and you know yeah you i would probably wouldn't normally have read past that either but I thought it was very interesting that he could separate, you know, that he could find a way to separate the expensive stocks that were expensive for a reason from the other ones. So I, I wanted to, and you know, also for us, the long only strategy did hold its own. You know, it's it's not as if his long only strategy underperformed. You know, it, the top stocks with the highest G score did do pretty well as a long only portfolio. So we felt it was something that was worth capturing for our website. Yeah, that's uh, I, I like that. Uh, just just to change tack a little bit here, and that's that's. Uh, that's a pun that's wholly intended. Uh, you're a you're you're a sailor. I am. So tell us a little bit about you. What 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 sort of sailing do you do? I do uh, sailboat racing. I have a 35 sail uh, foot sailboat, and I race it on Long Island Sound off of Connecticut. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I think I'm a glutton for punishment because I, I tend to go after these things in life that are you know very difficult to solve. These problems that are very difficult to figure out, and so investing is obviously a problem that is almost impossible to figure out. No matter how good you are at it, you can always be better because there's always more variables going on than you can possibly account for. And sailing is kind of the same thing. You know, you're out there racing other boats, trying to sail directly into the wind. And the, the only way you can sail directly into the wind, because obviously a boat's sails won't fill going directly into the wind, is to take this back and forth approach where you do these 45 degree angles to try to get to this mark before all the other boats. And at the same time you're doing that, you're dealing with all these variables that are changing. The wind speed is changing. The wind direction is changing. The currents are changing. The other boats are trying to mess with you and prevent you from getting to where you want to go. And so a lot like investing, it becomes a problem that you can't solve. So sailing for me is a great way to get on the water, be outside, have fun with my friends, but also you know, face a, a very strong challenge at the same time, face something that's, that's very difficult to figure out so it keeps my mind working at the same time. 
A thirty-five foot uh, boat. How many? How many crew do you have on a on a boat that size? When we do our serious racing, we'll have uh, seven or eight, depending on how heavy the people are. There's there's a weight limit that's associated with it that we can't exceed. Um, so we, we do two types of racing. We do some serious racing on the weekends, and then we do a Wednesday night beer can type race where everybody races. You know, people might enjoy a beer every, during the race, and then afterwards you go over to the bar and everybody hangs out. So that's a much more laid back, and that that's just based on who can get off work at the time uh, to, to make it there in time to do it. So, you know, that racing, the numbers can vary, but when we, when we do serious racing, it's seven or eight people. I would have thought that the, the the best analogy between between sailing or racing and and investing is that you spend a lot of the time going against the tide and a lot of the time going <laughs> against right. the wind. Yeah, that's right. You, you you definitely have an uphill battle a lot of the time. There's no doubt. And yeah, sailing into the wind is obviously the most challenging part of a sailboat race. Uh, you know, once you turn around your mark and then the wind's behind you, it's it's a much easier thing. But that the the, the force forcing the boat through the wind and trying to figure out the optimal path to do it and sailing against currents, you know, that, that can definitely be a challenge. So uh, just to bring it back to investing, we've over the last few weeks, maybe three weeks ago, there was this pretty violent turn in the markets where momentum stocks uh, seemed to break down pretty uh, heavily in one day that, and then that continued on and value stocks had had their best day. And I think both of the momentum stocks had their worst day in 10 years and value stocks had their best day in 10 years. So that's going back to 2009, which is a pretty good time for value. So have we turned the corner? Do we now have a tailwind? I wish. You know, it hasn't, it hasn't really held since then. And, you know, I still haven't. I mean, you may know better than me, but I still haven't found somebody who can make a great argument as to exactly what happened on those two days where, where value turned like that. I, I don't really know that there's a great explanation as to what happened. Um, and, you know, the problem with calling the turn is, you know, you never know when it is. There's really no academic, you know, there, there's no long-term data that's going to allow you to call the turn. And the turn can go on for any period of time, and it still might not actually be the turn. So, you know, 2016, we had a year that looked like the turn. You know, after Trump's election, you know, value stocks, small stocks did, did exceptionally well, but yet then it wasn't the turn. And so, you know, the problem with calling the turn is even when we think it's the turn, it may not be the turn. So... You know, I don't know that there's any great way to do it. I think all you can do is just sit here, you know, through the pain of value investing and understand that, you know, when things do turn, they may turn in a big way and you have to be around for that, you know, in order to succeed. It, 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 is, it is incredibly hard to work out what happened that day just because it was, so, it, it was such a big move. It felt coordinated. So it felt like it was one big player deciding I've, I've had enough of momentum. I want to get some exposure to value. Yeah, it did. You know, it had to be for that kind of move to happen. I mean, I think it was it was something like a five sigma event, I think. Right. You know, and if you take the odds of that happening, the odds of that are incredibly low. So, you know, something went on, but it just the follow through really hasn't been I mean, it hasn't value hasn't done terribly since then, but you certainly haven't seen follow through like that since then. It worked so, for a you know, few I weeks. Hope it was turn. Yeah, it worked yeah. for a few weeks and then and then it was it sort of softened up a little bit last week. I I, I don't know this week. The only thing that I have noted uh, and it's been a kind of it's been intermittent but uh the momentum stocks or the glamorous uh software as a service type stocks a lot of them do seem to have broken down so netflix as a as an example is it's done a round trip for the year but it was up 44 percent at one stage for the year and now it's now it's off um so it's flat for the year and I've, i've seen that in a few i just wonder if there's some uh overall kind of People are just getting tired of the more expensive side of the market. And it's hard to see where they can go from here. Yeah, and you know sometimes the expectations will just you know collapse under their own weight. And you know that that a lot of times you know investing is such a game of expectations. And you know at some point the expectations for those types of companies are going to get too high, and and they're not going to even though they'll still be growing, they're not going to meet those expectations. And that could be a big part of when this finally turns is when those companies consistently can't meet the expectations. That Wall Street has put on them, you know, that's when you might might finally see a turn. And maybe, as you said, maybe we're starting to see that a little bit with companies like Netflix. I mean, I hope so. Uh, you know, it's it's been a very long run here, so uh, you know, ho- hopefully things are starting to turn in the other direction. I wonder if it's that a lot of the IPOs have been very disappointing. A lot of the IPOs are down, kind of eye popping amounts, and then we work coming right up to the the threshold of of, of listing at what seemed like an absurd valuation and then not being able to get it done. And now the, the knives are out for the CEO there. 
Yeah, you know, this is that's one way that this is very different than the late 90s. I mean, you could pretty much get any garbage out as an IPO you wanted to in the late 90s. It didn't matter, you know, what the company, you know, com tons of companies that should have never came public did. And now they seem, you know, people seem to be looking at these companies. And, you know, WeWork got destroyed. You know, when they filed their S1, they got completely destroyed because for, and justifiably so. And they're not going to be able to get WeWork out, it looks like. And, you know, things like Uber and Lyft did not do well after their IPO. So, I mean, maybe that's also a sign of a turn to some degree. Is, you know, these they can't get these tech IPOs out like they used to, and maybe that's a sign of sentiment turning against it. The uh, the risk, I guess, is that it's just the 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 air comes out of the really expensive stocks, and you don't see uh, the value value stocks getting much of a run because I still think value uh, value is much much cheaper than the rest of the market, which is you know which is not always the case surprisingly in the, in the mid 2000s uh, 2010 value I think was quite expensive there was not much of a premium or there was not much of a discount to being in value you were probably paid to be in a more growthy end of the market there so I think one possibility is just that all of the steam comes out of the really expensive stuff but value still doesn't do anything because it's not kind of cheap enough for any of the fundamental guy the PE firms or anybody to kind of come in and do anything yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, value is cheap relatively, but it's not, I mean, it's somewhat cheap, absolutely, but it's not, you know, it's definitely not crazy cheap, absolutely. So you're right. I mean, it could be a rotation here. You know, a lot of people tend to anchor on, you know, what happened recently. And so a lot of people expect this 2000 situation to happen again, you know, where you get this huge bear market and value actually goes up during the bear market, or at least small cap value does. And, you know, that's probably not what's going to happen because it's usually, you know, usually what we expect to happen based on recent events is not what actually happens. So, you know, you could have a situation where both end, both end up going down, but, you know, growth just goes up, goes down more. And so, and, and I know you've argued a lot of times for a long, short implementation, and, you know, that would be your best argument for some sort of long, short implementation here is that, you know, if everything goes down, you want to get that spread between value and growth ra rather than betting on value on its own. That's right. That's the, I think that's the, the kind of the best argument at the moment for long, short is that the, the expensive side is three or four times its long run mean, whereas the, the, the cheap side is about 50% rich to its long run mean, which you could you could explain by having very low interest rates. Yeah, so I mean, I think you're right about that. I think it, you know it could be it, that could be the exact situation that plays out here. You know, we may not have the huge returns from value we hope, but we may have pretty good relative returns. Have you noticed any of your strategies uh, working particularly over these last few weeks? Is it the is it just the value strategy, or is anything else kind of perked up? Yeah, no, I mean, basically, the deeper value it is, the better it's worked over the past few weeks. Um, the type of stuff that has done horribly, you know, in this whole value downturn has been the stuff that's been doing the best. So I talked about that strategy based on jo Joseph Piotrowski before, which uses only price to book as its valuation metric. That's been one of the absolute best. So that low price to book asset heavy type company, you know, that had done horribly during the entire thing is, is sort of, for our strategies at least, has led the way back. And, you know, the cheaper, you, the further down you go in value, the better you've done. The deeper the value, the better you've done. I see people on Twitter describing it as a junk rally, which hurts my feelings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess to some extent, you know, <laughs> to some extent, all these value companies do have issues. You know, it's, you know, we're not betting on them being the greatest companies. You know, we're not betting on them being the, bet, the next Google. We're betting on the, the fact that the market is overestimated on average these problems. And so, you know, I think owning junky companies is sort of part of what we have to do to be, to be a value investor. Well, Jack, uh, really appreciate the insights that you've given us today and the time that you've spent talking. If folks want to get in contact with you, what's the best way of going about doing that? Well, they can reach me personally on Twitter, uh, at PracticalQuant is my handle. Um, our blog is blog.validity.com, where the articles we discuss, where they can find those. And then our capital management site is validiacapital.com. And you've got an ETF out there. What's the ticker on your ETF? Yes, the ticker is Valex. It's called the Validia Market Legends ETF. And you've got some blend of the 45 strategies you hold about 100 stocks roughly we have, roughly equal weight yes we have 80 stocks right now uh equal weight um which is eight strategies we're using right now 10 stocks from each of the strategies to come up with 80 stock portfolio and how often do you rebalance that portfolio we do it once a month so that's that's lots of uh lots of activity in there so it's a it's a probably a good etf to to take a look at jack forehand thank you very much thank you for having me my pleasure.